We're going to see who else we have in the audience. You know, last week when we were here, let me mention before I start, I always say through the door on the right-hand side, there are outlines, so if you're following along, if you'd like to review what I've said or if you'd like to check any of the verses used, uh, you can find those back there both for this evening and this morning's sermon. Last week I was talking and I made a statement, and then I began to think about that statement, uh, and, and I thought I probably ought to spend some time talking about it. I'm glad that John used the song that he did right before I came up. How beautiful heaven must be. That's important for us to remember as we look at the topic which is at hand today. I'm going to talk about our attitudes regarding death. And you may say, ah, we don't like to hear sermons like that, right? Well, I, I mentioned last week when I was talking about dying, I said specifically, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just not ready to die yet. You know, I, I got things I'd like to do. Most of us don't like to talk about death. We don't like to think about death. I want you to, I want you to understand that really, for us as Christians, death is not a bad thing. We really ought not to look at it like it's something to be scared of or, or fearful. And you may think to yourself as we talk about this topic, especially for our youth, you may say, that's something I'm going to think about later when I get a little older. None of us has promised tomorrow. I was thinking about a preacher. I read this about a month or two ago. He got done preaching, and he had just given the invitation call. And the person who, who wrote this up said he gave an amazing sermon uh, and a great invitation. And, and he sat down, and he literally died right there. You're not even promised to make it through this sermon, I guess, this morning. But if I had to pick a way to go, I'll be honest with you. That, can you imagine dying surrounded by Christians right after either hearing a sermon or giving a sermon? I began to think about this a lot throughout the week, the topic of death. Again, you'd say that's probably not something you want to spend a lot of time on. Let me give you two things that I thought about quite a bit before I, I spend uh, the majority on the sermon. I was working in my yard this week, and I began to think about this topic, death. And here's what I came to, and I hope to be able to relate to you today. Every single thing that we think or believe about death guides all of our actions, all of our beliefs. What we think about death guides every single thing that we do. Okay, And you may not realize that, but I began to think about, let me give you two examples here. I began to think about, and I've mentioned to you that, you know, my parents, since I became a Christian, they, they don't really go out of their way to talk to me a whole lot. But I've also told you I don't go out of my way to talk to them a whole lot. And I thought about that for an hour or two, at least, this week. You know why I think I came to the conclusion I don't spend much time seeking out a relationship with them? How many of you have family members who are not Christians and it's hard to look at them knowing that they're not righteous in God's sight and that when they die, they're not going to go to heaven? Well, I began to think about this sermon and I began to think about the fact that what I believe about death, what I know the scriptures teach about death, makes it hard for me sometimes, I think, to face reality. Is it okay for me to ignore them because of that? Absolutely not. I need to try harder to teach the gospel. My point is this. What we believe about death, it affects everything about us. It affects our relationships with other people. And then I began to think about one other thing. If I didn't believe that death led to the resurrection of the dead for the faithful, and if I didn't believe there was a place called heaven, which John just sang a song about, I certainly wouldn't be a Christian today. And I can say that because I'm going to be honest with you. There were things I enjoyed out in the world prior to Christianity that if there was no such thing as death and if there was no such thing as a place called heaven, I'd go back and continue to do that stuff. Why do I tell you all that? Because what we believe about death guides everything that we do. And so I hope that as we spend a little bit of time talking about death, it's going to encourage us to live so that we'll inherit eternal blessings. I hope that it's going to encourage us to have a desire to go out and to evangelize, especially to our family members who are, who are maybe not Christians. I hope it's going to help us to, to give answers to those who are seeking out what happens after death. I hope that it's going to encourage us to pray more fervently. I hope that it's going to encourage us to be more thankful to God because of what He has done for, for us on, on His behalf. I hope that it's going to encourage us to be steadfast in the faith. And so I want to talk about 
our attitude regarding death. Now, you know, if I'm going to talk about the biblical attitude regarding death, uh, certainly I'm going to talk about non-biblical attitudes regarding death. And I'm going to start off in that area. And I'm going to give you a few of the common ones, some of them which, are, uh, which were very common in times past and seem to have resurfaced. I'm going to start off talking about an attitude um, which is the attitude of the Christian scientist. Now, you may say, I've never heard of that group. Isn't that a group that was popular at one time? This group that I'm going to talk about, which was founded by Mary Baker Eddy, was a large group, very prominent in its time. It has dwindled significantly, but it's been resurrected in different forms. And so I use that name to describe If I had to describe it in terms you guys might know today, I'm going to use a movie. How many of you have seen The Matrix? Remember in that movie, reality was not reality? That's the, that's the thought process that I'm talking about here. It's what they believe, and it's what many people today are beginning to also believe. They believe that matter, sin, sickness, death, all of that, none of it's real. Try to grasp your hands around that for a minute. None of that stuff's real. They believe that that's all in your mind, okay? They deny the reality of death. Now... They do this because they believe that man's not a physical being, that man's only a spiritual being. And so, because of that, man can't actually die. And they go so far as to say the only reason that a person dies is because he believes that he's no longer in fellowship with God. Does that sound like that's a little bit out there for you? You may say, that's unusual. Would people even continue to believe that? I want you to know that this idea, this concept has resurfaced. I'll tell you where in a second. Let me read you a quote from their doctrinal beliefs. This is what they say. And there are others teaching this still today. Death is the belief in death. There's no death as humans are immortal spirits. After that which we call death, spiritual development toward truth continues until all evil or error destroys itself. Heaven and hell are not places, but states of consciousness that continue after death. Heaven is the self-made eternal bliss of re realizing oneness with God. And hell is the self-made anguish of believing in pain and death. They said, there's no such thing as heaven or hell. It's only what you make it to be in your mind. And yet I'm confused because I go back to Genesis 5, chapter 5, verses 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, 20, 27, 31, the list goes on and on, where he says uh, they died. He doesn't say they believed they died. He says they died. Okay? The Bible shows us time and time again that people actually die. Death's a reality. How many of you have ever seen a, a dead body? You ever been to a funeral home? I've been there. They say that's not real. It's not real. The only reason that guy's no longer alive is because he's come to the realization that he's no longer uh, in the presence of God. And as I thought about this teaching, this is being taught uh, by many people in the New Age movement that may not be something familiar you're familiar with. If you want to watch some of that air, uh, you'll see that being promoted on Oprah Winfrey's channel. She brings these people on. They teach this. Uh, a number of the people teaching this. One of them actually not far away from here in Warren, Michigan is the dominant people teaching this. Um, it's the idea that, that heaven and hell, they're not even real. It's only what you make it in your mind. And if, you, if, you, if it's what you make in your mind, then in essence, really, everybody's going to go somewhere and they can all go to heaven as long as they all have heaven in their mind. Does that sound crazy to you? It is, but it's re-emerging and it's being taught by many different people, okay? So that was one of the things I began to think about. That's an attitude that's becoming more prevalent. You've got the attitude of the escapist. Now, this is a person who fears death, and so they just try to avoid all mention of it. And I, I think about an example would be Louis XV. Maybe you have read about this. He forbid his servants from ever mentioning the word death in his presence. Psst, psst, don't say it. And you know why? And this idea that if people talked about it, it might make it actually happen. There are people today that do this. You, you look at different cultures. The Chinese culture and some other cultures believe that if you even mention the word death, you're, you're, bring, you're inviting it to come in, right? And so they're very fearful. They're, they don't they want to ignore it. They don't want to talk about it. That approach doesn't really bring a whole lot of comfort. Uh, just ignoring something. This is, okay, I'll talk to the men. How many men are like me? How many don't go to the doctor? I don't go to the doctor. I haven't been to one in years. If I fell over and died, my wife probably wouldn't be surprised. I haven't been to a doctor since. Because in our mind, we think if we don't go and we don't receive bad news, it doesn't really exist, right? If he hasn't told me that I'm sick, then I'm not sick. 
That's the idea of the escapist who doesn't want to talk about death. If I ignore it, maybe I'll outlast it or it'll go away. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, again, that doesn't bring any comfort. Okay? So there's the people who just try to avoid it. You've then got the attitude of the fatalist or the stoic. You may say, who's that? This is the guy that he, he accepts death with really no emotion at all. I'm not happy about it. I'm not sad about it. It's the guy that says, you know what? I, I'm alive right now, and one of these days I'm going to die. I'm going to fall over. They're going to put me in the ground, and that's the end of it. Psst, that's what it is. Well, that's, again, kind of a depressing attitude. Who wants to walk through life thinking I'm nothing more than a bunch of, you know, a bunch of flesh on, on attached to bones walking around, and then when it's done, it's done. Um, there was a guy who's a comedian. If, if you listen to comedians, he talks about the brain being nothing more than a meat computer. If that's your idea, is that you're really just nothing more than a bunch of meat attached to a frame, and, and when you're dead, that's it. It's gone. It's meaningless. That's extremely depressing to live like that. Why live a life full of goals only to die and have none? Doesn't that seem contradictory? You've got that kind of person. You also have the attitude of the blatant infidel. You probably know people like this. These are people who uh, they curse death and the God that allows it. You might hear him say something like, who wants to believe in a God that would allow people to die and then allow them to go to a place called hell? That's this kind of person that is a blatant infidel who, who really, they know people die and they really blame God about it and they get angry oftentimes when people die because the person's taken away from them. You then have the attitude of the despairing pessimist. You may say, well, what is that? This is a person who's tired of life. It's a person who's, you probably know people like this, and, and you feel for them. It's a person who struggles to get through life. They really have no hope whatsoever. They may even consider suicide. You know, if they were a Christian, they would go back and they would remember verses like Matthew 19, 18, Thou shalt not murder. That includes your own body. But this is a person who is so overfilled with this world, and because they don't have an understanding of what the Bible teaches, they're in complete despair, and they may consider something like suicide. The last person I can think of that really affected me when, when they did this, and m many of you remember, is when Robin Williams killed himself. How does a person that seems to be so happy and so full of life allow themselves to be drugged down to the point where they have no hope and they don't even want to wake up tomorrow? But it happens. It's because he had a distorted view of death. It's because he, he didn't have the correct biblical understanding. I wish he would have gone back and looked at verses, although this pertains directly to Christians, but 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I wish a true Christian would have been able to talk to Robin Williams before he got to that point. Because I guarantee you if, you, if somebody who was a Christian had talked to him and had taught him the gospel and brought him to understanding of Christianity and death and what happens after death, I guarantee you he'd have never done that. I guarantee you. Because a Christian with an understanding of death and what it leads to, what it really leads to, it wouldn't do something like that. You've then got the attitude of the, the sentimentalist. This is a person who... They love, they love death scenes. They love the idea of death. They love the idea associated with, with sorrow and agony. Um, oftentimes, this is associated with groups kind of like, maybe you guys are familiar with the goth craze. It's people who are really, they enjoy things that revolve around death. They, en they enjoy things that revolve around darkness. Uh, they get caught up in the idea of death. Just like there are people who love to, to watch thrillers and action movies, there are people who love to obsess and talk about things that have to do with death and, and sadness and suicide. And You may ask why. I don't know why. You'd have to go back and talk to a, you know, to a psychologist about it. But I will tell you this. There are people who are obsessed with death, and, and because of my, my studies in counseling, I will tell you that there are some who are obsessed with the idea of death because of obsessive compulsive disorders or anxiety disorders. Those are things that they, they need to go have somebody usually help them to get over. Some people just are obsessed with the idea of death. 
You've got those who have the idea they're religious fanatics and they, they have a martyr complex. And you may say, what is that? This isn't to be confused with true martyrs, not people who literally in the first century were, were persecuted and died. What I'm talking about are people who are looking for an opportunity to die for the name of Christ. And you may say, who does that? I can give you a couple examples. How many of you are familiar with the, uh, the Catholic Church? You've probably seen the movies. Anybody in here watch Vikings? Anybody seen the guy with the whip hitting himself on the back? Anybody watch that lately? Okay, it's the idea of asceticism. Most people who have this martyr complex believe in asceticism. They believe that if they get killed for the name of Christ or if they punish themselves, that they receive blessings, okay? One of the subgroups would be Opus Dei. They, they, I've told you before, they wrap barbed wire around their legs and they wear it under their pants all day long. The, pain, the barbed wire digging into their calf muscle and, and pain literally bleeding. They put sharpened nails in their pockets because they believe that throughout the day as they are hurt and punished, they receive some type of blessing for it. Not uncommon that we just do it, that people do it today. It was, it was back in the 2nd century B.C. up to the 1st century B.C. through the Essenes. You may say, I've never heard of that group. How many of you know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? The group that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls were the Essenes. They lived out there in those caves because they, they deprived themselves of all money, possessions. They lived in, in, in poverty, and they also believed in asceticism. They, they would punish themselves in order to receive blessings. There are people who are like that today. Many verses they could go back and look at. 1 Corinthians 13.3 would be one. And though I bestow all my good goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, charity, it profiteth me nothing. Just the simple fact of being an ascetic who punishes themselves, hoping to get blessings, doesn't counteract the fact that maybe you're not living righteous in God's sight. It doesn't bring blessings in and of itself. But there are people that have that, that concept today, even thinking that if they die in His name, it automatically gets them to heaven. Well, that's not in the Bible either. Well, so then how do we as Christians, amongst all of this error, how are we to try to view death? Well, certainly I think the way we would view death as Christians is to view it as the Bible views it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about death what the Bible says about death, and hope it gives us a little understanding. I'm going to tell you, most people, when they preach about death, they preach about it from a very negative aspect. I hope that as we go through this topic, you're going to find this is a very positive aspect. The reason we look at it as negative is because in our mind, we've made it negative, okay, as Christians. The Bible doesn't teach about this being a negative topic. So let's talk a little bit about biblical attitudes uh, towards the death of the righteous. For those of us who are followers of God, death is a very precious thing. You go back to the Old Testament, uh, from, from the very beginning, those who were followers of God, they believed that dying was actually something that was wonderful, that was precious. Listen to Psalms 116, 15. Precious, is, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Followers of God have always had a biblical understanding that dying as a faithful follower of God is a good thing. And so we could look back in the Old Testament, we could begin to look then into the New Testament, and you're going to find the exact same thing. The reason is, is because viewed from God's perspective, when somebody dies, it simply means that that child of God is getting to come home. How many of you have seen stories recently, I've seen them this week, on your Facebook page about people who are missing from home. Runaways. Uh, there's a preacher down south that's missing. Uh, he's in his 80s, I believe. But imagine how exciting it is when somebody who's been lost or who has been separated finally gets to come home. What a wonderful moment. And that's what we see here as we look at the Scriptures. That's the proper way to think about death. How many of you have been to a funeral where they call it a home going? Has anybody ever seen that word? They don't call it a funeral. They say we're going to a home going. That's the right way to think about death, right? It's not just some dead person in a box who's laying there uh, and, and the world is, is over for them and that's it. When they left, it was their home going if they were faithful Christians. So why do we cry? It's because we're selfish. I'll talk about that in a minute. But for Christians who know where they went, we cry because we're selfish, but we don't cry because uh, they're taken from us. We know where they're going. One of the biblical attitudes about death for the Christian is that we're removed from evil and we're at peace. 
Listen to Isaiah 57, 1 through 2. He talks again about the followers of God. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. You know, in, in times of trouble and despair, the righteous are often caught up in moments of the loss of life. I was just talking about when someone dies, oftentimes we are upset, we're angry at God, we're hurt that they're taken from us. And the reason is, is because oftentimes we are selfish. I look at death much different now as a Christian than I did before, but I will tell you, um, it is hard for me to go to a, a funeral for a Christian that I know has been faithful, not because they died. I mean, I know where they go. Usually it's hard for me because when you take a Christian away from the congregation, that's one less person to encourage, to strengthen, to build us up, to give us the example of faithfulness. I don't cry because they're gone. I cry because they're not here to help build us up and strengthen us. I don't cry so much for those who I know are non-Christians. I struggle with that a little bit. But when they've made that choice to reject God and His Word, and they've known, they bring that upon themselves. But for the Christians, it's, it's hard for us to lose somebody who builds up the congregation. We have to consider it from a very positive perspective. This Christian, this person who died, they have finally gone to their reward. They no longer have to deal with evil. They're now in peace. And yet we cry because we miss them. But we know where they are. You know, faithful Christians, when we die, are carried away by angels. Do you ever really think about that? I go back to the account in Luke 16, 22. Listen to how this follower of God was carried away. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and he was buried. You know, when we die, we are immediately released from all the suffering that we have to deal with in this world. Uh, talking about angels is not something we spend a lot of time on. It's really probably something we should study a little bit. Here we have the follower of God who is taken, taken away to this place of comfort. Most people today misunderstand this idea of when we die. Where do most people think we go when we die? They would tell you, He went to heaven. No. That's the eternal resting place we eventually get to, but no, that's not where we go. You go back and we understand that faithful Christians will go to paradise. Faithful followers of God and other dispensations go to paradise. Listen to Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's what he told that thief, right? And many people in their minds say, Oh, paradise is heaven. No, it's not. It's not the same thing. What we understand, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. We've talked about it a lot, but when we die, we know that Jesus talked about going to the Hadean world. We understand that He told the thief they would be in paradise. And so in this Hadean world, the area of Hades, you have the area of torment and you have the area of paradise, also called Abraham's bosom. And Jesus went down into Hades, the general area into which they went into paradise, Him and that thief. He never went into hell. People teach that. When we die as Christians, we go to this place called paradise. And our departure, our dying, is really an exodus. It's an exiting. It's a leaving. Paul viewed his death as a, as a departure. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.6. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That word departure there, listen to this, that word is exodus. That word actually means to decease. It means to exit. It means to leave. It's the exact same word describing the exodus we read about in the Old Testament when the Israelites were taken out of Egyptian bondage. Imagine he uses the word exodus. The same word in which they were released from bondage is the word he uses to describe the death that allows him to then go to paradise. You see the key in that word, exodus? Peter uses this word Exodus. 
2 Peter 1.15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. That's why Peter uses this word here. I might have said Paul. It's Peter that uses this word. Paul looked at it as a departure, but Peter calls it the exodus. And the reason they can look at this with, with an excited attitude is because death is gain. Death is something far better than what we have right now. I know that doesn't seem normal in our minds, but it is. It doesn't seem right. We don't want to die. I don't want to die. I said, i got things I'd like to do. But if I were to die, and if I were to be found righteous, so I could go to this place, paradise, wouldn't it be a hundred million times better than what I have right now? But in our mind, for some reason, we look at death as being evil. It's horrible. Why? Because it takes, it away from, takes us away from our loved ones. But it's far superior than what we have right now. Listen to Philippians 1, 21 through 24. And, and Paul really has this figured out. And I think if you were to be honest with yourself, this would sum up how you think, and I think it sums up how I think. For to, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I want not. For I'm in a strait between, uh, betwix, betwixt two. He says, I'm stuck between these two, these two concepts. Having a desire to part, I want to go to heaven, he says, and to be with Christ, which is far better. But he says, here's my other option. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. I want nothing more than to go to heaven. But you remember I said, I still got things I want to do. Paul says, you know what's more needful for me to be here right now with you? I want to go to heaven, but I still got stuff I need to do. I got stuff I want to accomplish, but I want to go. Just not yet. That's the mindset we ought to have as Christians. I know that doesn't seem right. We should want to go to heaven and be ready at the drop of a, of a hat to go to heaven, but have the mindset of, I haven't converted enough people yet. I haven't taught enough people yet. I haven't done enough for His name yet. So I'm not ready. But that's the mindset of Paul as he talks about death. He was looking forward to the reward, but he had so much left that he still needed to do. To die is to be with Christ and at home with the Lord. We already looked at Philippians 1, 21 through 24. But listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's why death was looked at so positively by Paul. Now, for the Christian, death is sleeping in Jesus, yet living with Him. You know, whenever I make a statement, sometimes I know people will teach weird things out of it, and I have to be very careful. Let me read to you two sections of Scripture, and I'll talk about this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not for those who have already died, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. And he's not really talking about sleeping people there. He's talking about people who've passed on. He's using a, a word. It's, it's a synonym. He's using a word to describe those who've already died. Okay, That's what the word sleep is. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9-11, through 11, For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So those who die, those who are faithful followers of God, they are said to sleep in Jesus. This doesn't teach the doctrine of, of soul sleeping. Now you may say, what in the world are you talking about, Sean? That's something that somebody obviously with a Ph.D., and a whole lot of intellect was sitting around one day and they just came up with. Came up with the idea of, you know, when you die, your soul goes to sleep. Uh, as a matter of fact, they gave it a big name. I'll give you the big name. You'll probably not remember it. It's actually called the Doctrine of Conditional Immortality. Sounds impressive. I guess the more impressive you make something sound, the more believable it is, right? Well, what that means is, is, is that, well, your soul just... It, it, it ceased or it's no longer existent. There's a couple different things taught regarding this. Uh, it's taught primarily by the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists, although they teach different things regarding it, so I'll tell you real quick. 
To be more exact, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach soul annihilation. So when you die, your soul just, it's gone. And when I talk to them, I say, so what happens then to the soul? And they said, if you are a Jehovah's Witness, a faithful follower of Jehovah, then at the judgment, the soul is brought back. Boom. And you then get to spend either your time up in heaven, 144,000, or on paradise on earth. Okay? But if you're a horrible ranked person, sinner, it's just gone. No punishment. I said, so what doesn't keep me from just living that way? Just when it's over, it's over, you know? Why not live it up right now? Oh, well, then you couldn't, you couldn't be one of the elect. I said, are you one of the elect? He said, well, you just have to know it in your heart. Well, they teach that people, their souls, when they die, it's just they just disappear. It's gone. Then you've got the Seventh-day Adventists. They teach something a little bit differently. They actually teach that after death, you're just not conscious about anything anymore. Your soul actually goes to sleep. And it lays there. You guys remember what inert gases are? Gases that don't do anything? They teach that the soul is inert. It just resides in the memory of God until the resurrection. And then poof, it's back. And yet, I read the scriptures and I go, that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. First of all, it totally contradicts Luke 6, right? He was, he was consciously aware of what was going on, right? While he was there in the Hadean realm. He knew exactly what was taking, on, taking place there in Luke 16. If I said 6, I meant 16. Uh, this idea that the soul just falls asleep or that, it, that it's inert, that's not what we're talking about here when he says we sleep with Jesus, okay? Because listen to 1 Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 5.10, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You see that key word live? That key word live is showing that we are in the presence of God. We have to be. If we are living while we yet sleep, and we know that faithful Christians are in paradise, you see an active relationship going on right there, right? That's how we sleep in Christ. We're, he's talking about being dead, and yet he's talking about a faithful follower who's reached this reward. Finally, faithful Christians, they receive a blessed rest from their labors. I told you, if I didn't believe in death, and I didn't believe in resurrection, and I didn't believe in a place called heaven, I wouldn't be a Christian. You know why? If, if all you believe in is this world, you're not going to succeed monetarily in your job, the list goes on and on unless you live like the world does, unless you excel like the world does. Living as a Christian wouldn't get you anywhere in this world. So if I didn't believe in death, if I didn't believe in the resurrection, if I didn't believe in judgment, I wouldn't be a Christian. And yet we understand we are going to receive uh, a reward from our labors. That's, that's part of the reason that we as Christians live the way we live. We have a hope of something, right? Listen to Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. He's talking about the saints, and when he says die in the name of the Lord, he's not talking about every single person that walked around saying, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I do everything in his name. He's talking, he's talking about those who lived according to the authority of Jesus and the Scriptures. And I always use the example, but it seems to, to get the point home. When someone says, in the name of Jesus, it's like when the officer knocks on the door and says, let me in in the name of the law. Let me in by the authority that the law bestows upon me to have that right. The name of Jesus is by the authority of Jesus. And those that live by the authority of Jesus, we find being foretold of this place they're going to get to go to when they die. What else could make you want to live a righteous life? What else could make you not be fearful of death but knowing that? Revelation 14, 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I hope that's sufficient to make you want to live a faithful Christian life. We all have different ideas about what we believe is going to happen when we die. Whatever we believe about death and what's going to happen needs to be in alignment with the Scriptures. I only covered a little bit about death today. The study on death, if we were to do it here, would probably take forever. We don't seem to move through studies very quick. But I hope the short time we've spent today changes your mind a little bit 
about the idea of death. And as I told you before, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not. I could walk out the door and as I'm taking the trash to the road, get hit by a dump truck or something. It could happen. But here's the thing. Because I have faith, because I have knowledge, and because I have understanding, I am freed from fear and death. And you can be too. Listen to Hebrews 2, 14-15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Am I afraid to die? No. But I'll tell you this, I don't, I'm not ready to go yet. Like Paul said, i got stuff I want to do. i got people I'd like to convert. i got people I need to teach. I want you to ask yourself as I draw this to a close, have you been freed from the fear of death by a correct understanding of death and what it brings? And have you been added to the church so that you don't have to worry about it? That's the ultimate question we're going to look at today as I draw this to a close. Have you been added to the church? You may say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about being a, being a faithful Christian. You may ask somebody, how do I become a Christian? You'll get a lot of different answers. And I'm going to tell you right now with Scriptures, and if you've never been here before, or if you've never studied this, I would encourage you to write them down. The conversion accounts always show somebody teaching them the Gospel. You could learn on your own. It's much harder to do it that way, but we understand people learned who Jesus was and, and what He taught, and they believed. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you need to hear the Word of God so that you can come to the understanding that Jesus was the Messiah. We know Hebrews eleven six. 6, when they did, they had faith. John eight twenty four also. They understood that they were going to be accountable for their sins. Romans three twenty three. all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there will be a consequence, Romans six twenty three. And in every conversion account, you'll find the pattern of them understanding who He was, believing who He was, repenting of their sins, just as He commanded, Luke 13, 3, also Acts 17, 30. And then confessing the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10, just as He commanded, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And then being baptized by immersion for the remission of sins. You want me to sum it up even more simple? Believe that He's Jesus and do what He said, get baptized, and then live faithful. That's how simple it is. When you do that, 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, and you're living for that crown of righteousness, you're not going to fear death at all. You'll have the attitude of Paul that you're not ready to go yet, but if it were to happen, you won't fear it. If you're here today and you're not a baptized believer, you should be fearful of death. I'm fearful of death for you. If you are here and you are not a baptized believer, if you have not been baptized by immersion for the remission of your sins, please do not leave without talking to me. Because if you were to die, you're not going to be found righteous in God's sight. That's not my opinion. I'll give you the verses. I'm telling you out of love, please do not leave without talking to me. If you have another area you're struggling in, I'd love to sit and talk with you or study with you. I'm sure anybody else here would also. Maybe there's a way we can pray for you. Uh, I take great encouragement from those who, who are willing to say, I'm struggling and I need prayer. And I don't have a problem telling you when I'm, when I'm doing that. Sometimes I struggle and need prayer too. If you're here right now and you're struggling in life, I don't care where it's at. If we could pray for you and help you, we'd love to do that. You can make either of those situations known to us as we stand and sing a song of invitation.